You know, it's exciting to be in God's kingdom and to be able to be a son or a daughter of God because that means that everything in front of us is there to figure out how to be used or ignored, if it's simple, to the glory of God and to other people knowing our great God. In 2007, a film was released entitled I Am Legend. Wow. And I don't know if anybody saw that movie, but I loved that movie. You know, it's a post-apocalyptic movie. It's supposed to be like two years later. So it was released in 2007, but it was supposed to be in 2009. So, you know, if you ever see a movie that's like two years down the road, you're like, wow, could this happen? And then you just realize, okay, it's Hollywood. Like, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> but the whole point of the movie was that there was Will Smith played this scientist who was a fighter, but also somebody who's going to find a cure. And the last words of the movie... Go like this. In 2009, a deadly virus burned through our civilization, pushing humankind to the edge of extinction. Dr. Robert Nabal dedicated his life to the discovery of a cure and to the restoration of humanity. On September 9, 2012, at approximately 8.49 p.m., he discovered that cure. And at age 52, he gave his life to defend it. We are his legacy. This is his legend. Light up the darkness. Wow. Wow. You know, it's an amazing film and I mean, powerful words to finish with. Yeah. I mean, the world is blown away by somebody who's willing to give their life. Who's willing to find a cure, and the cure in the movie was the blood of Will Smith. Wow. And then Will Smith gave his entire life to destroy the darkness yeah. and to be able to provide a cure for mankind. Wow. Yeah. I thought, that sounds a lot like Jesus Christ. And whether the world realizes or not, we are fascinated by Jesus Christ. And we love heroes. I mean, we love heroes in our lives. You think of superheroes. I mean, who doesn't know about Superman or Batman or Iron Man or, you know, this man or this woman? Or, I mean, there's so many superheroes and we're blown away by them. I mean, sports champions. And I know everybody's so excited because the University of Oklahoma last night won the NCAA championships for men's gymnastics. And this is the third year in a row that they won. And I know everybody's so fired up about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Maybe just I was. I mean, and my incredible wife, Joali, because she just totally supports me and what I love. And uh, I got to compete gymnastics in college at the University of Oklahoma. And it was incredible because at the time, we won NCAA championships in 2005 at West Point and then 2006 in Norman, Oklahoma. And then, unfortunately, we, we got second place the third year. Now, this was amazing because they were back at West Point and they won back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back championships. The first team to win three NCAA titles back-to-back -back in Division I gymnastics. Wow. And so that was pretty awesome, but we love the champions. I don't even know who got third place. I honestly do not know who got second place. I just know who the champion was. Yeah, sure. Now it's amazing the NBA finals are going on and you know there's all this talk about what's LeBron gonna do, you know, Steph Curry, I mean, Isaiah Thomas, and whatever, I, I don't know who's exactly still in the finals or who's been weeded out, or and maybe you're not a big sports fan, but but the NBA finals are going on right now and there's gonna be a champion crown at the end of the NCAA Finals. You know, if you watch March Madness, you saw, I mean, the Ducks got to the Final Four, which is pretty awesome. And then, you know, North Carolina ended up winning the thing, but I mean, we remember there's great champions. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Ducks fan, but I'm also a Michael Jordan fan, you with know, North Carolina, but I don't say that stuff in, you know, on campus, so. But we love champions. You know, we love award winners. You look at the Grammys or, you know, different award winners, and we don't really remember who was runner-up or totally all the nominees or the people that weren't even nominees. Even though they may have done great things, we love champions. We love the winners as a society. We love the story of those who overcome. And we want to see them and we want to be inspired by them so that we can have our own story yeah. of greatness. You know, today we're going to look at the greatest hero to ever live. We're going to look at the greatest leader, the greatest speaker, the greatest human to ever walk the face of this earth.
and see how he called each and every one of us. Not only to see him, mm -hmm. to know about him, to be educated about him, but for us too to follow in his footsteps and become heroes ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. The title of our lesson this morning is Let's Get to Know This Hero. Come on. You know, so often we want to know the backstory about how people got to where they were. You know, I loved hearing about Michael Jordan, and I loved hearing about, you know, uh, these famous athletes, like, uh, I loved Barry Bonds, you know, and I'm not saying that these athletes had perfect pasts, and none of us do, so um, no finger pointing here, okay? No, no stone throwing. Uh, we, we, all, we all need great guidance and, and help, but, but I love knowing the backstory, you know? Where did they come from? What was their upbringing like? You know, what was their mindset? What was their mentality? I mean, how can I become somebody like that as well? Growing up, I wanted to be an Olympian. Uh, that's just what I wanted to do. Yeah. And so I got to know the stories. I started emailing different people who were on the Olympics, and I was blown away that uh, this one guy, Raj, uh, he started emailing me back. And he, he was kind of like being like a mentor to me because I had a pretty bad injury. And I was like, man, this Olympian and I are just like talking with you. And he, and he took time like to write like pretty long emails. And we, we had a, a kind of a, a mutual coach, so there, that kind of opened the door. So, uh, but I was so inspired to know the backstory. And I started to think, wow, I too can have a story that would lead to this same outcome if I stuck to it. Yeah. Now, it took a lot of faith through injury, and I did get to compete through NCAAs, but I, I, I stopped after that because I realized that God was calling me to something different, and I just wasn't the caliber of athlete that he needed to be to be an Olympian. But this hero, Jesus, lived a perfect life, laid out a perfect standard, brought a perfect amount of grace with the perfect amount of truth for us to be able to follow in his footsteps. And he calls all people, whether you're, whatever your race is, whatever your nationality is, whatever language you speak, your social status, your upbringing, to follow in his footsteps. Come on. Let's go to John chapter 10. Come on. Here in verse 7. Do it. Bring it. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 7. Okay. Our first point today is he paid the ultimate price. All right. John chapter 10, here in verse 7. It says, Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. Jesus, he was just always telling the truth. I mean, anything we look at, you can just know that Jesus was telling the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. No, you have to understand it when we read the Word of God here that Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. Yeah. He knew exactly what he stood for, and he knew exactly what all mankind needed to become. Yeah. You know, so oftentimes, you know, I can, I can be indecisive at times, and I know it, it makes Joali feel not very protected, or other people very protected when I'm, when I'm kind of ind indecisive. Yeah. You don't get the sense that Jesus was ever indecisive. And he's talking about the most deep subjects of morality, yeah. truth, and eternal life without a single hesitation. Wow. This is a great hero. Come on. Jesus goes on to say that I'm the gate for the sheep. It wasn't that I'm one of the gates or I'm one of the entrances that you can go in to find true pasture and a relationship with God. Jesus says, no, I am the gate. And the only way that you are going to get to God is through me. You know, Jesus teaches that 
This is the way to be saved. And so oftentimes people say, well, I don't know if I need to be saved. Well, let me tell you, Jesus goes on to say, everybody needs to be saved. <laughs> everybody needs to find the safety for eternity inside of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. Yeah. You know, so oftentimes we invest our lives in an unfailing plan. Yeah. But yet the Bible says in the Proverbs that, that we desire an unfailing love. But where do we go to find love? Where do we go to find satisfaction and fulfillment? So oftentimes we go to the world. We go, maybe if I just see this new movie that came out, then I'll be happy and my problems will go away. Maybe if I can just convince my boss to give me a raise, man, that extra $3 an hour would just totally fix all my problems in life. Yes. Maybe if my teacher would just give me the pass and say, hey, you know what? I'll give you an A this time, and then all my problems will go away. Oh. And we put our hope in these different kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Then what happens? Maybe the maybe the, the it gets answered, and maybe you get a great door that gets open and it leads to another door, and then you find yourself in the same position that says, I need another hope to come my way. Yeah. Come on. And Jesus just says, Look, I'm the gate. You gotta narrow down your life, get rid of anything you need to get rid of, so that you can fully come to God through me. Come on. You know, so oftentimes people want to live in a society that maybe drugs is the answer. And I can share about that because I really used to think that if I took certain types of drugs, I took prescription pills, I'd smoke marijuana, I'd drink alcohol, I, I thought that this warm feeling that I would get would, would be the answer. And now that I have the answer, now I can, I can really get through and I can handle the issues of life. And sadly, what ends up happening is you become overcome. And it starts to destroy your life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm so grateful that six years ago, somebody had the guts, had the courage, had the boldness to stop me on the street of New York City. Come on. To say, hey man, I want to study the Bible with you. And I said, no, I go to church. I already grew up in church. I already go on Sundays. I'm good. I'm busy. And I'm so grateful somebody said, no, no, no. We need to get in some Bible studies. What's the purpose of your life? Are you holding the Jesus teaching? I was like, all right, I'll come to a Bible study. <laughs> and we sat down and I started to see the gate. I always believed in the idea of Jesus. But I very clearly saw from the Bible that I was going down this path, thinking about Jesus, but the gate was this direction. And so in order for me to go through the gate, I had to radically let the scriptures change my life. Oh, yeah. Make those deep down changes, and let me tell you, I had to make some big changes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's totally the power of God that allowed that to happen. Amen. It was drugs, it was impurity, it was just deceitfulness, it was selfish ambition. I mean, the first 25 years of my life, I built it up for myself. <laughs> and it felt like now going through that gate meant that I had to destroy and crush so many of those dreams. <laughs> and the people studying the Bible with me said, precisely. <laughs> And by the grace of God, God allowed me to turn away from those dreams and start taking on the dream to go through the gate and live on a narrow path. Amen. You know, we get the sense from this passage that, you know, Jesus is going to be there through the thick and thin. How many times in life do, do people walk out on us or, you know, maybe it's haven't been there for us when we're in our deepest time of need. And we start to lose hope and we lose trust in people. We lose trust in, in even believing that there's something out there. And Jesus is there saying, I'm the gate. Come to me. You know what the thief? He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And isn't that what the world does? Yeah. I mean, so warmly coming to a new job, coming to a, you know, a new this or a new set of friends. And the moment that you mess up, oh yeah, by the way, you're fired. <laughs> oh yeah, by the way, that uh, we actually don't want to be around you anymore. And this one thing that seems so great, so awesome. Now it turns into something that's stolen, killed, and destroyed. Mm -hmm. And we're left empty. And I appreciate Sierra sharing that. Her whole life, she was looking for something that would protect her. Something that would give her hope and give her her faith and give her just vision. Yeah. And she was able to find through the scriptures that that was Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Yeah. 
Jesus comes so that we can have life and have it to the full. Right? Yeah. You know, sadly, we live in a society that says life to the full means more money. What? Life to the full means incredible friends. Oh it means another story on your house. Oh it means a couple more cars in that garage. Oh That's what life to the full means. <laughs> no, we see Jesus live life to the full. Come on. Yeah. He had a full relationship with God. Yeah. He had a full love for humanity. He had a full cup to drink. Amen. Woo! And he drank it for each and every one of us. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. You know, life to the full is going to look different for each and every one of us. Yeah. But life to the full is going to be the life that, it, that you will live when you go through the gate of Jesus. Come on. And Jesus actually goes on and say, yeah, you need to narrow down your life. You need to get rid of some things. And that's why we study the Bible. And studying the Bible is like this amazing process where the, the things just get peeled off that aren't supposed to be there. You know, and they, get, they actually, not just on the outside, it just goes straight down to the depth of your heart. Yeah. And then it pulls that one thing out that you don't want to get rid of. And it pulls it out like that, and then it gets rid of it. Yeah. And Jesus says, okay, now you can live life to the Lord. Because oftentimes that's the thing that's going to keep you from praying to you. That's the thing that's so comfortable that's going to make you think you don't truly need a deep relationship with God. Wow. But if we would go to the scriptures and we would go to what Jesus taught and we let Jesus peel apart our lives, then what's going to happen is we're going to find life to the full. And we're going to find a life full of gratitude for the one who gave up his entire life for us to be able to have life to the full. Amen. You know, the pasture that Jesus talks about is unique. He says, when you give up everything and you come through Jesus, you find pasture. Yeah. And isn't what we want in our lives? I mean, we want freedom. We want more money so that we can be free. We want to be able to have no rules so that we can freely do whatever we want. And Jesus yet says, if you come through me, what you find is freedom. Yeah. But there's an amazing, uniquely, perfectly designed humbling process that you have <laughs> And it's a little something called deep Bible study. And, it's like, yeah. and you find the fight of a lifetime. You know, the gate to, to follow Jesus, it's a straight gate. It's a narrow gate. It's not a gate that the world's going to mark it up and build. It's not the gate that, you know, you're going to go to work and your boss is going to say, that's the one to follow. It's not what you're going to see on TV. It's not what you're going to find typically on the internet. It's not even going to be what you typically find in a family or a social setting. It's a straight gate and it's narrow. Mm -hmm. It'll bring you to the fight of your lifetime. Mm -hmm. And that the fact that Jesus paid the ultimate price should motivate each and every one of us to do whatever it takes to be on that path. Come on, Brian. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Right. You know, excitingly, uh, we can see from our first century brothers and sisters some of the things that they had to go through in order to be on that path. It's amazing as Jesus became the hero, he raised up great leaders who would in turn become heroes, not because of who they were. We know certainly it's not because of who they were. I mean, we learned even uh, on Wednesday night, Peter was the duh disciple. He was constantly just kind of dropping the ball and kind of just, you know, Matthew was the kind of money hungry guy. He was like, hey, let me you know, pull a deal here, and we see all the different disciples that they had all their different traits, but they were they became heroes because they fully surrendered everything to become disciples of Jesus. And as they became heroes, they became heroes that preached this message to their cities at the time and to the nations at the time. And they traveled around and they planted churches and they called everybody to give up everything and make Jesus their number one priority. Yeah. And here are some of the heroes we read about. In the first century, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, here in verse 9, it says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed. Amen. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. You know, it's amazing that the Spirit of God through Paul is helping the first century church realize that nobody is better than anybody else. 
But he's saying, wow, this is what you guys used to be. Wow. You guys used to be sexually immoral. You guys thought it was okay to just be in immoral relationships outside of the marriage covenant. You guys thought that was okay. Yeah, yeah. And whether you thought it was okay, okay or not, you guys were living this way. No. Yeah. Yeah. You guys used to have idols in your life. You guys used to make work more important than God. You used to make your education more important than God. You used to make relationships more important than God. Some of you guys used to make yourself more important than God. That's me. I used to make myself way more important than God. He says, some of you guys used to be homosexuals. You guys used to be this. Some of you guys were thieves. You're just greedy for yourselves. You were swindlers. You were slanders. I mean, you used to cut people down behind your back. Wow. But you were washed. Yeah. Amen. You saw the gate and you said, you know what? Of all the things that I can do in my life, I'm going to take seriously the scriptures. And I'm going to let God change my life. I'm going to make great decisions to become a disciple. And because when Jesus paid the ultimate price, that was enough for me to say, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. You know, later in verse 19, the appeal continues. <laughs> it says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. You know, it's a clear understanding that the ultimate price should motivate us to realize that we don't even belong to ourselves anymore. I mean, so often times we say, well, I only do this, or I only do that, or that's just the way I am. This is the way that I want to be. This is who I think I should be. And the appeal through the Spirit to the first century church was, look, you just got to realize that you don't belong to yourself anymore. Yeah. You were bought at a price. You know, for me, I, I can fall into the sin of selfishness sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes I can, I can be here and I just say, well, I want to I wanna be able to do what I want to do. And it's so humbling to remember that, wow, Jesus paid the ultimate price. I don't belong to me anymore. No. Yeah. I belong to God, and through, through God, God has a standard set that we're called to follow. And He paid the ultimate price, and the cross now takes away any excuse to be unloving, to be unkind, Amen. to be judgmental. I mean, the cross says, no, 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 you don't belong to that stuff anymore. Yeah. That may be who you used to be. Yeah. And there may still be temptation to become that. But at the end of the day, you were bought at a price. Yeah. And it's a priceless price, which is unique. Yeah. <laughs> it's a price that it doesn't matter. Bill Gates can't buy this thing. Yeah. You put all the biggest philanthropists and the most famous people in the world in, and you put all the money in their bank accounts and all their power and all their authority and they can't buy this. Yeah. Only through the blood of Jesus can we be forgiven. And through that heroic effort, we should be compelled to do whatever it takes. Amen. Our second point is, he always calls us to follow. Right. You know, we looked at it last Sunday about the resurrection, and, you know, the, really the disciples were kind of, I mean, they were all in, and they were kind of unsure, and, you know, after the resurrection, Jesus conquered the grave, and he conquered death, and he made a way for all of us. To be able to overcome anything, we now see the apostles lay down their lives for the call. But in Jesus' ministry, there was a clear message about what it would take to follow him. And let's go to Luke chapter 14. Come on, Brian. I mean, this is an amazing passage. And here's Jesus, and for some people, this was the first message they ever heard. They were trying to just give a great first impression. Yeah. Oh, you know what? For me, I'm like a huge people pleaser in my nature. I'm just like, man, I don't want people to, to like me. I don't want to offend anybody. I want to be super kind. I, want, you know, I don't want to drop the ball. I don't want it to be my fault that somebody gets a little ruffled. And here's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Large crowds. Yeah. Some of these people he's never even talked to. Yeah. Some of the people, this is the first sermon they've ever heard. Ah. And we're going to hear Jesus preach Good. an incredible yeah. message. Amen. Amen. Right. But before that, we're going to hear a short story. Yeah. <laughs> it says, a troubled and a burdened man prayed and prayed that God would lift his burden. Day after day, he prayed that his life would be easier, and he begged for God's intervention. One day, Jesus came to the man and asked, my child, what troubles you? The man replied that his life was full of turmoil. 
that had become too much to bear, he again asked for help, stating that he just couldn't go on. Jesus, feeling the man's anguish, decided help was in order. The man was so happy that his prayers were about to be answered, and that his burden already felt lighter. Jesus took the man to a room and stopped in front of the door. When he opened the door, what the man saw was incredible. The room was filled with crosses. Little crosses, big crosses, giant crosses. The man, bewildered, looked at Jesus and asked, how's this going to help me? <laughs> Jesus explained, well, each cross represents a burden that people carry. There's small burdens, there's large burdens, and there's even giant burdens. And every burden in between. And somebody's carrying each and every one of these. At this point, Jesus offered the man the opportunity to choose his burden. Wow. The man was so excited that he could finally have control over his life. And he looked around the room, and for just the right cross, he saw the giant one, he saw the, the large one, and he saw the small ones, but he saw the tiny one right there in the back. He says, that's the right cross for me. It was the smallest cross in the room, and after a bit of thought, he said, Lord, I've decided. That's the one that I want to take. <laughs> well, Jesus asked the man, are, are you sure, my son? The man quickly replied, oh, yes, Lord, that's the one I want. Most definitely, I'm sure. Jesus turned to the man and replied, son, that is the cross that you came in with. Oh. You've chosen the cross you've been carrying. Amen. Amen. Let's read Luke 14, here in verse 27. In verse 27, the Bible says, Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Yeah. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Wow, can you imagine if this was the first sermon you've ever heard by Jesus? Your first church experience was just flat out. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. You see, in our lives, we all have a cross to bear. And some people say it's a burden and it's just natural things that go on, but it's more than that. Our cross becomes who we are and how we're shaped by the world and society. And our past experiences. There's a promise in the Bible in Matthew 24 that Jesus says, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. You know, we live in a society that's the increase of wickedness is happening right before our eyes. You look at all the places on the street corners, you got liquor stores, you've got pornography shops, I mean, you got marijuana that's totally legal now, you've got all kinds of things that are happening over and over and over. You're a bad person if you talk about homosexuality being wrong now. But yet the Bible clearly teaches that these types of people will not go to heaven. But anybody can change. Yeah. Anybody can change. Yeah. Does that change how you treat people? No. In fact, we need to love deeper people yeah. who are deeper in this wickedness. Yeah. A lot of times what people teach is you shun these people. No. 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 Jesus says you need to love your enemies. Yeah. You need to pray for people that persecute you. Yeah. This is a very, very high calling. But because of our life experiences, we develop a personality. Yeah. 
Hmm. We develop a soul of who we are. Hmm. We develop a certain type of heart about what we care about. Hmm. We develop certain dreams and certain aspirations. And what Jesus is teaching here that if anybody doesn't carry his cross and follow me, they cannot be one of his disciples. Hmm. Now, a disciple is simply a student or a follower. And so Jesus was calling us more than just to carry our burdens. But Jesus was actually calling us to give up our dreams that contradict his word, our aspirations that contradict his word, the very things that we see in the world that contradict his word. If it's our heart, if it's our soul, we've got to carry that stuff and we've got to die to it so that we can move forward and live for Jesus. Amen. And the truth is we all have our own cross. And your cross is going to be different than somebody else's cross. Yeah. But Jesus can relate to it. Yeah. Jesus goes on and talks about counting the cost. And you know, anytime that we baptize somebody because we study the Bible with them and help them become a disciple, and they've made a decision to become a disciple of Jesus, it's because they've made a decision that they have counted the cost to give up everything and be a disciple of Jesus. Amen. And so oftentimes, after we've counted that cost once and we decide that everything is everything. Yeah. Well, what's unique is that you don't have everything at that moment. <laughs> Late in your life, you're going to have something else, but that's going to be part of everything. <laughs> but it's nice that you've already counted the cost, and that's your commitment to Jesus, because now that everything, even though it's a different thing, it's just part of everything, and you've already given it up. <laughs> you know, nothing less would be accepted by Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus goes on to say that if you're able, you've got to count the cost. You know, once you count the cost the first time, the way that you stay able to count the cost is through your prayer life and your Bible study. You know, so often what happens is if we're not reading our Bibles, if we're not praying, everything starts to become bigger than our God. Yeah. And everything starts to be right here. And once God was just fully right in front of us, and then stuff started to get in front of us. Yeah. And it got to the place where it was about knee height, and it's like, oh, I'm still see God, you know, it's okay. And then everything piled up a little bit higher, and a little bit higher, and then this wasn't good enough. So it's got to go a little bit higher, and then everything becomes right here. Mm -hmm. And we start to see life, and priorities, and stuff, and materialism, yeah. and we stop seeing our great, perfect God. Who paid the price? I mean, our second point is that he always calls us to follow him. There's never going to be a time in our lives where Jesus stops calling us to make him our number one priority. You know, in our society, there's this idea that there's two different kinds of Christians. There's like the garden variety, kind of normal Christian that goes to church and if it's, you know, obviously it works out of the way, but if it works in the way, then Works in the way. My heart is, I'd like to, but I'll go hopefully next week. Yeah. This is kind of Christian. Our society teaches that there's this other kind of Christian that's kind of weird, but it's this fully committed, devoted disciple. <laughs> now, very clearly in Jesus' ministry, there was no such thing as two different types of Christians. There was either being Christ like, giving up everything, carrying your cross being motivated by the sacrifice of Jesus to do whatever it takes to build his kingdom. And then there were onlookers. <laughs> Pagans. Other religions. Atheists. See, the call to follow Jesus is always going to be the same. The call is always going to be everything. The call is always going to be carrying your cross. And maybe you don't know how to carry your cross. I would be taught how to carry my cross. I mean, my cross was, for me, it was so heavy, and I couldn't even imagine carrying it. But as people started studying the Bible with me, I saw that Jesus wanted to help me carry it. But even knowing that Jesus wanted to help me carry it, I didn't know what that looked like. Yeah. I was like, cool, where's he at? <laughs> and we studied the Bible and say, wow, well, he's saying this is the way to go through the gate. And I said, okay, well, I'll change this area. And before you know it, God took away my desire for drugs, my desire for getting drunk, my desire for being with women, my desire to be critical, all these different desires. He started peeling away. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, like Paul says, there go I, lest the grace of God. 
So if we're not focused on the grace of God, and we're not motivated by the sacrifice of Jesus, that stuff is right around the corner again. Yeah. Yeah. But when we make the decision to carry our cross, and to know that the call to be a Christian is the call to give up everything, we will be motivated by this call. Amen. You know, oftentimes people want to be religious and have a connection with God, but don't want this connection to affect certain areas of their lives. I appreciate Marvin sharing about contribution. Jesus talked more about money than many other things. Mm -hmm. It's actually one of the most talked about mm -hmm. subjects in the Bible. Wow. Why? God doesn't need money. Mm -hmm. But money is connected to our hearts. Yeah. God wants all of our heart, and the way to our heart is through our money. <laughs> and so Jesus talks about it a lot. You know, this results in being involved spiritually in matters that appeal to us, but not allowing God to have authority over the areas that are a bit challenging. That's why Jesus said, if you're going to follow and be a disciple, everything's got to be on the table for him to have authority. And Jesus draws an incredible line. The line of discipleship to say, wow, I want everything about you. It's actually, I mean, people can read this and say, wow, Jesus is it's like a tyrant. I mean, this is hard. But when you realize that the Bible is actually a love story for you and your relationship with God, for me and my relationship with God, it's actually very encouraging. Yeah. You know, I, I love being married to Jolly. Aww. And I believe that Jolly expects me to be fully committed to our marriage. Amen. And I expect you all to be fully committed to our marriage. Come on. This isn't weird. Nope. This makes sense. Yes. Yeah. But yet when it comes to God, the world teaches that you don't have to be fully connected. You keep certain areas off limits. You do your thing because nobody's perfect. Yeah. And then it just stays justified that we have these partially involved religious people. Yeah. And we don't see the glory of God in our day. No. And we should. Mm -hmm. Just like a marriage covenant is serious and there's devotion. The commitment to God and Jesus and His Word needs to be even more serious and there needs to be even more devotion. Yeah. You know, it's the same call for the rich and the poor. The younger, the old, the healthy and the unhealthy. The mature and the immature. And Jesus can never be guilty of having fine print. <laughs> what you see is what you get with Jesus. Yeah. And as you study the Scriptures, you see Jesus' call for what it is. And the challenge for all of us is to take a hold of it. You know, I'm so inspired by an amazing couple, uh, Chuck and Elizabeth oh, Hess. Oh. Elizabeth Hess. <laughs> yeah. Now, in 2008, there was the planting of the Washington, D.C. church. Yeah. And the Washington, D.C. church was being planted out of Syracuse. And, you know, it wasn't a very dynamic church as far as race went. And so the mission team went out, and the mission team was there and said, wow, we need some white people on this mission team. Because we do believe in being a church of all nations and all races. Amen. 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 We're an international family. Yeah. We're not just like a white church or a black church or a Chinese church. Or We don't believe in that. We believe that everybody comes from Adam, everybody's a child of God, and that everybody needs to be part of God's glorious kingdom. Amen. Amen. And so there needed to be more of a dynamic on the mission team. And so, amazingly, you know, Chuck gets a phone call. And he's in, the, he's up in Corvallis, and he's in the middle of his finals. And he gets a phone call, and the, the call is, uh, Hey, Chuck, how's it going? We just are out here planting the Washington, D.C. church. Oh, and Chuck's like, man, I know, it's so awesome. It's so incredible to see what's going on. And, and uh, you know, Chuck, we were looking at the mission team, and, and we're really seeing it'd be great to have a song leader, you know, a couple that would bring a more flavor, a different flavor of grace. <laughs> and, and we saw that you guys really fit the bill to be on this mission team oh. to really help advance the church. And Chuck said, wow, well, I don't know the finals. Um, sounds great. Let me, uh, let me talk to Elizabeth. And, you know, I, as the time went on, they, they prayed about it. And the next day, they were on a flight to Washington, D.C. Oh what did they do? They counted the cost when they became disciples mm -hmm. to do whatever it takes to spread the word of God in their day. Amen. 
And so even though they were here in Corvallis, they encountered the cost to say, wow, we're going to meet the needs as they come up. Yeah. Because we've already given up our lives to the call of God. Wow. You know, we're inspired by Stephen and Jenny Rykstead. Oh, come on, Rykstead. Stephen and Jenny Rykstead were here in Eugene about five years ago. And in 2012, the, the Boston church was being planted. And, you know, Stephen and Jenny were great friends with Mandy and just really, you know, great hearted, you know, hard working, incredible disciples. And there was one thing, though. Jenny was nine months pregnant. Oh, oh that's a thing. Oh, and Boston's on the other side of the nation. <laughs> and their option is to leave all their stuff and just fly out there and start afresh or get in the U-Haul and drive across the country. Oh. Were they forced to go on a mission team? No. But their heart was to say, this is our lives. Yeah, amen. We're going to go out. We're going to help plant the church. Yeah. And it's amazing to see that church is almost at 100 people. It started on a mission team of about 15 people. And to see the way that Stephen and Jenny have laid down their lives, to see how advancing that ministry is in Boston, that their whole goal is to go this year to 200 people, and to see that many people are becoming great missionaries from that church. Counted the cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They said our lives are fully surrendered. We've already given up everything. Mm -hmm. We'll carry our cross. We've counted the cost. We're going to stay salty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in Dubai, excitingly, as we've been able to raise missions, last year we were able to send out the Dubai International Christian Ooh, Church. Awesome. And, you know, just in the last yeah. about 100 days of the year, they've had about 10 people get baptized, which yeah. is awesome. Yeah. In the Middle East, and have become disciples of Jesus. Yeah. And when you look at the just the dynamic of the racial culture in that church, it's like, wow, this church is an international church in Dubai. That's awesome. What I think is incredible about it is we know that already in April, oversee the church there. In April, she has about forty percent of her heart that works. Yeah. Well, April had to come back, and she was in the UCLA Medical Center because she went into cardiac arrest. And they were able to revive her, and you know I believe it was through the prayer and through just the sovereignty of God that, that she's she's better now. And but what was so amazing is even in their absence, the leaders being gone, they baptized an incredible woman. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. And I said, Wow! Look at what's happening as we've given our missions, as we've been praying for the international plantings. Even when the leaders are gone, they're raising up a ministry of leaders that can baptize and help people know Jesus, even in the absence of the lead couple. Amen. And what happens? It creates an effect that spreads, and that goes, and that grows, and that gets planted and moved and move. Come on. I appreciate Marvin sharing the contribution about how we may not see everything today. We may not even see it in our lifetime. You read through Hebrews 11, it says, most of these people were still living by faith when they died, and they didn't even see the promises come to fruition. Yeah, yeah. But I guarantee you from heaven, they're looking down, and they're fired up to see what's going on. Yeah. And we may not see what happens in our day with all the missions that we give. We may not see the effect of, of, of the impact that we're going to have. But I guarantee you that Ananias was gratefully baptized Paul. They preached the word of Paul that Jesus came to Paul on the road of Damascus. That's all Ananias did. <laughs> Look at what Paul went on and did. Look at what Titus went on and did. Look at what Silas did and Timothy. But it started from a mustard seed of faith that says we're willing to believe in God's plan. Out in Lagos, it's amazing to see that with a mission team of 11 disciples that went to Lagos, Nigeria. Unsure of where they would live. Unsure of just the conditions. You know, they talk about how there's there's just often power outages because there's not the, the right control in the electricity. So sometimes you'll just turn on the switch and, you'll whoosh, and you have no electricity. Sometimes you turn on the water and the water just comes out dry. And it's amazing. They're on the mission field. 11 of them went out there. Eight other people joined them as they were out in Nigeria. And just in the last year, that church has grown to 70 disciples. And that church is important. the cross that Jesus calls us to carry, it's, it's more than pain and suffering. It's death. Yeah. It's dying to our 
own ways. It's dying to our own dreams often in order to now build the dream of Jesus to see the world one in our day. What Jesus went through should move us to put to death anything in our lives that gets in the way of that. And to do God's will each and every day. Because Jesus calls us to follow and the call to follow is full commitment and nothing else. And my question is, is that where you stand today? I'm so grateful that God put people in my life to truly study the scriptures. I grew up in church 25 years, youth group, did fellowship with Christian athletes, I've been in many different group college ministry type things, um, went on mission trips. But ironically, nobody sat down with me and taught me how to be a disciple of Jesus according to the Bible. Yeah. You know, we believe in, in sitting down and actually studying the scriptures together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We believe that there's such a thing in the Bible as first principles that are the basic teaching that we're called to not only build our lives upon, but to then go out and share with the world. But is that what we're committed today? Are we committed to follow? Point number three is, he expects us to always be grateful. Aww. Let's go to Luke chapter 17. As we wrap up here. Luke 17, here in verse 11. It says, Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us! When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Oh, thank you. I mean, imagine this picture. I mean, Jesus is walking along on the border of Samaria Galilee. Samaria Galilee. And he sees over in the distance ten people just yelling at him. Ever been yelled at by ten strangers? Yeah. <laughs> they love leprosy and they're just like, Master! Have pity on us! All of us! And Jesus just says, hey, go show yourself to the priest. You only show yourself to the priest when you're cleansed. Yeah. Wow. These guys still have leprosy. And Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. Now, for them to go to the priest with leprosy, this was bad news because they were already banned from the community. Because leprosy was contagious. These guys, I mean... They said, okay, Jesus told us what to do. Let's just do what Jesus says. <laughs> and they're walking, and as they're walking, putting Jesus' word into practice, as they're going, they're just like, leprosy's leaving. It's incredible. Wow. And this one guy says, oh my goodness, I'm so grateful. Yeah. i got to go find Jesus. <laughs> And he runs back to Jesus. He falls at Jesus' feet and thanks him. And he praises God. Wow. You know, here was somebody who was so thankful. And Jesus wasn't, oh man, I'm so glad that you get it. And yeah, good for you. Uh, thank you for really responding to the message. No, Jesus 100% expected people to respond to the message. Yeah. Out of a heart of sheer gratitude. He says, where are the other nine? Weren't, weren't they helped as well? Did they not have time to, to come back and, and pray? Did they not have come, time to come back and say thank you? Was there no time to, to give their best effort that, to, to now come and, and spend some time with me? They were blown away by how quickly they were ungrateful. And I think about the call. You know, is it a high call to follow Jesus? Yeah, it is. It's an amazing call. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus wants 100% closeness 
with each and every soul. And he says, you know what? A tainted relationship with me won't do. It won't do. You can come to me and you can be genuine and you can be happy and you can be nice, but if there's areas of your life that are off limits for me to have authority over, Jesus says, you can't follow me. Because it's not a real relationship. It's fake. You know, when we see the ultimate sacrifice, we see that, wow, Jesus paid the ultimate price. He was willing to do whatever it took to get the attention and the response and the change of lifestyle to mankind. And the only acceptable response is to go through the gate. The only acceptable response is to give up everything. To carry your cross and to continually come back at the feet of Jesus and be thankful. Amen. You know, for us in our, our prayer lives, I believe it's time to step up our prayer lives. Amen. You're having a hard time giving something up. You're having a hard time of being surrendered. You're having a hard time changing your character. How much time have you prayed about it? I was blown away. We were studying the Bible with a student, and we were studying out some really deep things, and, and we had taken them on the, you know, the cemetery there on campus, and we walked through the cemetery, and we prayed, and, you know, I believe that there's a, there's a sobriety that kicks in when you walk around a cemetery and you pray, because you realize that there's no other chance. It's all been said and done. And yet, we studied the Bible with this student, and he said, you know what, I just don't think that this really is that important, and I don't think that that's right, and I don't think that, I'm just not sure. And I just said, hey, how much time have you prayed about? Mm -hmm. So well, I prayed after we finished our Bible study, I was like, that was good. I was like, yeah, you prayed for about 20 seconds, it was awesome praying. <laughs> uh, but how much time have you prayed about? Mm -hmm. It's just kind of taken her back. She didn't take time to pray about it. And I think for us, there's, there's a huge demand for us to be fully committed to Jesus. Yeah. But is that our prayer? Yeah. You know, we see Jesus in Matthew 26. Yeah. He had to take three hours to pray, mm -hmm. to carry his cross. Mm -hmm. And when we try to do the will of God without taking time to pray, and vulnerably sharing our heart in prayer, I think we vulnerably share our heart on Facebook a lot. Yeah. Come on, Chris. Yeah. And Chris, those posts are awesome. Come on. Yeah. I think we vulnerably watch Netflix a lot. Yeah. We vulnerably give hours upon hours to these different things, and we give minutes, seconds, minuscules of our time to coming back to Jesus and thanking Him. Wow. For the ways that He's changed our lives yeah. and asking for strength to help us to continue to carry our cross. You know, for us today, the call is, who is this hero? Well, this hero is Jesus. Amen. This is a hero who paid the ultimate price. The hero who always calls us to follow and nothing less. And he's the hero that expects us to be grateful. You know, Marvin and I were talking, and I'm excited to, uh, start in the month of May, we're going to have a campaign of pray through May. <laughs> and Kareem and I, we've been brainstorming about how, you know, we... We'll pray through May, and then, you know, we'll continue to pray through June. <laughs> and then we'll get to July, and we'll pray through July. And until the Lord takes our lives, or until Jesus comes back, I hope that we'll be those who pray through our lives. Amen. Because Jesus is the greatest hero, and he deserves all of our attention. Amen. Amen. Amen.